So then, um, this talk will be a landscape urban uh, talk along with building archaeology. And it uh, will involve background on the excavation, which uh, I'm leader of, um, discussions on how the harbour developed over time, the late medieval uh, and renaissance weighing houses in the harbour region, and uh, a little chat about uh, the people who are living at the harbour site. So then, um, I'm, my excavation is one of 18 new uh, station boxes for the new Metro City Ring. And uh, the one I'm involved with is the harbour side, which is um, there. And that's one of the three medieval um, excavations amongst these 18 ones. And uh, mine dealt with uh, medieval renaissance and uh, uh, late medieval harbour side. And this is just another viewpoint of the new city ring. So um, this project's been running from 2010 to 2016 now, with a, a watching brief starting in 2010, where we found most of the building structures. And every time we found a building structure, we would uh, excavate it to the best of uh, the abilities within the system. And then there was... Um, an excavation for the new station box where we uh, followed the, the pathway of the new box and excavated to a me two meters deep where we had um, where the shoring could only reach for that excavation and then 2014 we had the actual big me uh, main excavation which uh, we excavated to about six meters deep and uh, involved having a 80 meter long tent on top with a a winch system to take away all the spoil. And there's been a lot of uh, fieldwork activities around the area, but generally there's not so much excavation within the, the medieval city boundaries. So when you get an, an option to actually dig inside, it's gold dust of new information for Copenhagen. So uh, as you can see, press the right button. This is the 2010 Watch and Brief area. This is the guide wall box, and this is the main excavation area in between. And uh, we basically found um, about 500,000, 600,000 fragments of pottery, animal bones, special finds, uh, stored or found within really good waterlogged conditions, so really good preservation. Um, the main excavation featured 22 to 36 people at the end, where it was really, really manic. And the main archaeology we find is from 1400s to, uh, to present day, but I'm going to talk about archaeology from 1400 to 1600. So the earliest harbour area is not yet found, and it's believed to be about 100 metres north. Um, and what we found from what I've seen from doing uh, research is that there's been a continual uh, growth of the new harbour. And um, we found uh, this 50 metres have been filled in uh, by land reclamation behind new harbour fronts. So every 50 years, the harbour rots, they build a new one, throwing all the rubbish from the local area because it's not municipally, municipality controlled then. And so you get a good idea of what the population was wearing, what they're eating, etc. And just to the very north of the excavation area, they found um, a few fragments of boats inside cellar excavations and loads more sort of medieval pottery. So unfortunately, until those buildings are moved by some manner, we can't really find the earliest harbour. So why was the harbour uh, created in this area? Well, firstly, protection. It's the southern part of the boundary which um, is protected by the castle on Castle Island in translating into English. And so everything that goes through the harbour has to go through the castle, uh, go past the castle. And then boat design. It started off like most uh, harbour sites in the early medieval period and late Anglo-Saxon. 
and Viking, where you pull your ships onto uh, the beach. But with uh, the starting of use of cogs and caravels, you needed a harbour front. So you would build a harbour front for the size of the ships. So whenever there were bigger ships, uh, as time advanced, they would have to build another harbour front to access the deeper water in the harbour. And then tax control, uh, mm -hmm. the authorities could then control entrance uh, and exit from the harbour, so you could always uh, control the tax. And then markets, there's two markets uh, directly north of the site, and there's just south of uh, Copenhagen in the medieval period, there are loads of small little inlets and islands, so they'd take away the worst of the uh, weather. And this is what you can see from this map, um, inverted, uh, this is the north, this is the south, and uh, the west and the east. So the harbour area is here, the Vajos is the weighing house, the Assisahus is the customs and excise house, which uh, we see more in uh, Britain and Ireland. And then you have the markets areas there, and Castle Island, Slotsholmen, and the toll house that was there to 1627. And from that period onwards, the town advanced eastwards, so uh, the town toll house moved to the new eastern boundary. So uh, this uh, thrilling design here was just showing us some um, the harbour fronts. And so this is the earliest 1400 uh, harbour front, which uh, had a line of uh, wooden bulwark set with a, with a stone uh, uh, base or wall just to the north. And then they had uh, loads of these storm posts in front for where ships would be uh, uh, tied to or prevent things hitting the harbour front, because then you'd have to rebuild it. And in the far west, we have more of these uh, type harbour fronts. Um, but unfortunately, with the washing brief, we, there wasn't so much dendrochronology done on these. But um, we know from the stratigraphy and the surrounding solar end that they were pushed into uh, 1400s uh, deposits. So then this leads, uh, those last uh, uh, bulwarks were up here. And this is a, a period of land reclamation then after um, after another, another creation of a bulwark down this area and you then uh, add more land for levelling to try and uh, get a firmer and drier surface for the houses and what we see here is a tiny bit of um, uh, foundation and uh, a type of piling uh, for the later building there and there you can see the really bad uh, cheap nasty uh, foundations there. <laughs> I think that's the best term to call it. <laughs> and this is an example of the nice stuff uh, being brought in for the elites who were, we know from records, were living in this area. So this is some uh, nicer bohemian glass. And uh, proto-stone ware from uh, the Siegberg area, um, Western Rhineland area. You have a lot of imports coming from uh, uh, Germany in this period. So this comes to uh, the Vajos, the, the first main building that we know was built on the harbour side. So in 1281, they were given the power to uh, build this uh, structure. And as you can see from this text here, beer is very important to Danish society even then, which is, <laughs> continues now as a, uh, a form of law as well. And in 1443, we finally hear a next bit of text linked to the weighing house. And Christian of Bavaria, the king at the time, said we should build a weighing house. And then we finally know from another record in 1514 that there is one there. So what is the purpose of these weighing houses? They're a public building used to weigh, max and measure and tax goods. And what we found from uh, the watch and brief excavations on Gammelstrand that the walls were 0.7 meters wide, so they could have another floor on, the, on, they could have at least one more story to the structure. And the area what, that was revealed within the watch and brief trenches was spread over an area 8 by 7 meters. And they may have had wooden foundations for the floors, 
and there was a uh, succession of five or six wooden floors in some areas so you could really see the effect of the damp soil destroying all the foundations and the floors of this building and then set within um, uh, the warehouse boundary was a cellar which uh, which uh, measured three by three meters wide in the trench and in one corner they had uh, placed a barrel and dug into it for wa water to be drained in so they had a real bad problem with managing uh, the dryness of the floors and there was a town's weight, weight master who was meant to live there but uh, as it's such an important position and the houses around were lived in by the elites I think it was more of a uh, um, secretary or person working in, in that type of industry. So these are the archaeological remains from it. We have the cellar here. We have the wooden uh, barrel remains. We have uh, part of uh, the six, five or six layers of wooden floor. And then we have uh, building remains coming down here. And there's a lot missing from this area because uh, there's really big gas pipes about a meter wide meter diam diam diameter going into these reg regions, destroying a lot of archaeology. And that's uh, the cellar there. That's uh, the wooden floors. Hey, you could basically peel off when you're excavating. And that's a uh, section through the barrel. And uh, this gives a good date for the uh, end of the building, which we knew from historical records, but it's uh, a bit of Siegberg ware uh, with the arms of Queen Elizabeth I that was dated around the 1560s in this style. And we found another style of this uh, Siegberg uh, beer drinking vessel that had the arms of a uh, Christian, uh, uh, no, Frederick II of Denmark and also the Holy Roman Emperor at the time. So these were marketed really. <coughs> so uh, more bulwarks and uh, more uh, land reclamation. So uh, this is the main excavation from 2014. And what we found is uh, that these, these, this is a mixture of rubbish slowly building up in front of a harbour side. And it was full of uh, late medieval with some re residual medieval um, finds, glass, special finds, um, CBM from the city. So knowing that there isn't any control of the rubbish system in, this, in Copenhagen at the time, we believed it's just slowly building up from rubbish thrown into the harbour. And you for, forever read these um, uh, um, documents saying you're, you'll be fined if you throw rubbish in the harbour. So uh, interesting how it actually got there quietly at night. And uh, we found more bulwarks in the very northeast corner and really really truncated again by big pipes going through the area but it appears there could be a, a double style um, uh, uh, bulwark with uh, loads and loads of small posts in between and as you can see the area is very packed with archaeology because uh, that's uh, a 1490s dated bulwark that's the 1580s stone wall and that's a lantai or Jordanka Podansk uh, dating to the 1600s so uh, that's what we we're finding at two meters deep in the guide or excavation and we couldn't excavate any deeper because of the uh, the excavation rules so we were stuck at a conundrum till we came to the excavation okay so uh, I'll just pass with this because this is more bulwarks and um, uh, more um, evidence of uh, rubbish being thrown to the harbour side and there's some Siegberg ware and cloth seals from Hamburg and representing the city you have uh, the uh, stove tiles from the area so the area of the harbour was a mixture of public and private buildings there was the weighing house the customs and excise house and the toll house and then all the properties around it were houses owned by merchants government officials farmers and citizens and this is found from documents. And then later on in the 1500s and 1600s, there's various companies uh, linked to the area. And uh, this is just an example from a 1588 plan of uh, Copenhagen of the types of structures built onto the harbour side. And that's a, a 1670s plan showing a uh, the harbour area and all the uh, rich inhabitants there living 
just uh, north of the king's place there, and that's the vial horse. So uh, this is just because I'm running out of time, I'll just pass through this. This is the harbour side in the 1580s, and it's very, very strongly built harbour to uh, uh, deal with the gigantic amount of trade that was coming into Copenhagen, which by then was turned into a Scandinavian metropolis. So uh, these are finds, uh, French hoods, uh, pass glass for drinking beer, uh, wear, wear from central Germany, and uh, starting of the globalization with uh, cracked porcelain. And the weighing house was then, um, there's a new one built in the same area, which uh, was up to five stories high, 30 meters wide by 21 meters long, had large stone foundations with monk stained bricks, and it's a mixture of a, an office, a storage place, and it's inhabited by a manager again. And this is what we found, uh, the northeast corner of it. And that's uh, evidence of the uh, foundations of it. And so we don't know exactly what happened beneath that. And this is the building, which was one of the first photographs in Denmark in the 1840s and it was still surviving until the change in the tax laws meant it, it was obsolete. So they just destroyed it and uh, unfortunately that would have been a great tourism spot there. Yeah. <laughs> and the materials that uh, was used to build it, build it uh, came from wood from the former Danish uh, territories in Sweden and also from Zealand, granite, which are glacial erratics, clay used to, um, look, we found from ICP analysis, either came from Zealand or Sweden, and, um, and that was used for all the building materials, that, and then limestone from Staines Clint for the nice facing stones. So we provenanced all that material. And as you can see from these type of uh, weighing buildings um, in other areas of Northern Europe, it was a quite ostentatious building usually, uh, and it would be one of the first buildings viewed when landing at the harbour side, so it had a, another role. So who organized the harbour region? It was organized by the elites, by the, the will of the king, for the people. Only they could organize the manpower, the import of materials, construction, pass laws to undertake these uh, uh, buildings and, and then maintain the infrastructure in the region. Uh, so to, to conclude, the harbour was developed in a myriad in an area for a myriad of reasons linked to ship technology, ability to create new land as the north, east, south and north, east and west borders were fortified, so that cost a lot more for that area to uh, expand. It was located next to the central markets and protected by the weather and the navy. The land reclamation process was governed by the city elites who could organise the project. The elites originally built, bought the land as it was cheap, as it was mm -hmm. waterlogged, and uh, it was, uh, this is confirmed in historical documents, maps and finds. And the area had a clear public and private areas. And Gamelstrand was developed into the administration area for this area until the late, till the 1800s when um, mainly all the larger ships could not get into that area from the 1600s. So it just became a administration area. And finally with the change in the tax laws, everything was moved to the east of Copenhagen, literally on the Oerson Sea. So, uh, thank you.